Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Sydney Sargent was our original speaker today. However, she was unable to make it. So we've got Philip Curtis, Director of Sales and Marketing for United Dental, back with us. Philip will explain how to avoid common PPO errors when hiring an associate. At any point during the webinar, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll answer it live at the end. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Henry Schein's Dental Business Institute, as well as Unitas Dental. With that, take it away, Philip. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Hopefully you guys can hear me and see me okay. Just want to echo what Adam said, uh, which is likely you're going to have a ton of questions throughout the presentation today. So feel free to use the Q&A section. Um, we won't be able to get to those towards the end, but instead of writing it down or thinking you remember it, go ahead and throw it in there um, so we can knock those out towards the end. Um, but if it's anything like what we've had before, we're definitely going to have a ton of questions. So I'm going to try to run through this information rather quickly um, and because I know we only have a limited amount of time today, but I really just wanted to hit these main points. Um, again, my name is Philip Curtis, and um, I'm here kind of filling in for Sydney, but happy to give this presentation to you guys today. Really what we're talking about is how to avoid the common PPO errors when hiring an associate. Um, again, here's my contact information. So if you have any questions after the presentation that we weren't able to answer, go ahead and write down my email. So it's my first name. It's P-H-Y-L-I-P at unitasdental.com. So feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions. But just a little bit of intro into Unitas and why we're presenting on this topic today in regards to uh, PPO errors and credentialing and adding associates is because we've been working in this industry in this realm for quite a bit of time. We've been in here for about 10 years working with dental practices specifically to help them negotiate their insurance reimbursements, and then also to help them get credentialed. We've worked with thousands of practices. We've been in all 50 states. We represent over, actually I need to update the slide, over a thousand locations right now. And we're located in Arizona. Um, we've got over 45 people on staff. So Sydney's right here down below, bless her heart. She's super sick today. So hopefully send some positive vibes her way. We want her to get better soon, but um, I'm taking over to kind of help her out today. But we've got a ton of people on staff that really help negotiate and credential with tons of practices every year. So with all that, um, after 10 years of credentialing and working with thousands of dentists, well, we've learned a lot. We've gained a lot of experience. We've made mistakes. We've seen mistakes. And so we've compiled really the top three mistakes that practices make when they're adding an associate to their practice in regards to PPO insurance. And so hopefully this is something that's interesting to you. I'm guessing if you're on the call today, it's probably because you're planning to add an associate, planning to add associates or, or just doctors in general or maybe you already have, and you're wanting to make sure that you did, you kind of checked all your boxes. So that's really what we're going to hit today um, is kind of how to avoid those common PPO, PPO errors when you're hiring that associate. And this is really just as applicable to hiring an associate, just as much, as much as it is to hiring or bringing on another owner. Really what this is about is whenever you're credentialing a doctor at your practice, um, in addition to the one that's already there, that's already the owner, you, you want to be aware of and evaluate these three main categories. Okay. So again, if as throughout the presentation, if you've got questions, put them in through that Q and a window. Um, hopefully you can figure out how to send that in. Otherwise you can also use the chat window too. Um, but we're really going to hit three main categories today. We're going to talk about considering and the importance of the provider's designation and how to create the contract, or at least some things to think about when you're creating the contract with an associate or an owner. And then we're going to talk about how to properly submit claims to PPOs when you're hiring, once you've hired and in, into perpetuitum. Um, and then we're going to really talk about and dig deeply into identifying your current PPO participation and why understanding that in, is important and how it affects your credentialing strategy. Um, uh, this is one of the most commonly missed and overlooked items when you're credentialing is understanding your current participation. But we're going to knock out all three of those today um, and then we'll open up for Q&A at the end. So super excited to go through this with you guys. So let's go ahead and just jump in. First and foremost, when we're talking about considering the provider's designation and creating a contract, we're assuming that um, you're bringing in an associate in this arrangement, but there's, there's a couple of things to be aware of in terms of the laws and regulations behind this. Just wanna go ahead and put out the disclaimer. I'm not an attorney, I'm not here to give legal advice. So if you're looking for legal advice on kind of how you should establish a contract or, or what type of designation you should put your associate under, I definitely um, recommend that you reach out to like an HR specific or an employee employment specific attorney in your area that can give you some guidance on what you can do, what you shouldn't do. Um, but for the most part, I can kind of steer you in, in a couple directions. First and foremost, we know that 
Personally, governmental agencies scrutinize employers of all kinds, specifically practices that misclassify their associates as independent contractors, okay? So a lot of times practices will set up an associate as an independent contractor as opposed to an employee. And so it's very important that you know the differences between the two and that you set them up according to what your true intention is. Um, so again, with that guidance, I'm gonna give you some tips here, but it's probably a good idea to always uh, consult an attorney that specializes in HR, health, you know, human relations, and also our human resources, and then um, employment in general. So, but obviously federal and state agencies are gonna seek to collect lost tax revenues, fees and penalties for payroll taxes and social security for wrongly classified providers or employees. Um, obviously, if you wrongly classify a provider as a 1099 and they were, or an independent contractor and they were actually an employee, then you're gonna probably back O or back be back dude on payroll taxes and social security because you weren't paying those. So that's why it's so important to understand the differences, set them up and classify them appropriately. So that way you're not um, kind of in the red or in the wrong. And then also obviously sometimes penalties may even be applied retroactively. So that's typically what can happen. If you get audited by the IRS, um, they can come in and kind of exclusively look at your practice and figure out what you were paying, what you should have been paying and go back and retroactively apply those audits and those fees. So it's something to keep aware of. Um, it happens, it happens to businesses all the time. I guarantee it's gonna happen a lot more with um, how much money our country has been spending and kind of financial assistant, assistance. So the IRS is definitely gonna be that much more uh, scrutinizing you know, businesses across the country. So there's probably never been a more important time to understand the differences and consult an attorney to make sure that you've set up practices correctly and that uh, you're planning on setting up your practice correctly with your associates that you hire, okay? Now, here's some main differences that we've been able to identify in terms of the difference, <coughs> excuse me, of an employee who's on salary or an independent contractor. So a W-2 employee, em, actual employee is on salary. They receive benefits from the owner doctor. They're contracted with the PPOs under the owner's tax ID number, not their own personal social security or other tax ID number at your location. So that's important. They use the equipment and supplies of your practice. They treat your existing patients. They have schedules managed by office staff um, and they have the practice submit their claims on their behalf. And then the difference of an independent contractor is a provider who purely bills under their own tax ID number and treats their own patient and ideally exclusively uses their own equipment and their own services within the practice. So again, there's a delineation there, but if you have a, if you're curious as to have I currently set up my own associate correctly, that's where I would recommend you pursue conversations with an employment attorney to kind of um, have them quiz you on it, make sure that you've set up correctly. Or if you're planning on bringing somebody on that you also do that as well. So the, the next thing that you wanna consider though too and one of the things that most practices we talk to fail to do is to have some type of a written contract. This is another one of those things you're going to want to have an attorney look through, but you want to consider, you know, what are the roles and the responsibilities of the owner versus the associate in that contractual relationship? What are the expectations for both the employer and the employee, including intentions for PPO and HMO participation? Um, are you uh, setting it apart in the contract that you are planning on getting them credentialed with your same insurance companies. Um, you plan, like, is that explicitly outlined within the contract? How is the compensation going to be structured? This is another big one that you want to consult and understand ahead of time, have it in a contracting consultant attorney, which is, are we paying you on a percentage of production? Are we paying you on a percentage of collection? Um, are you on an annual fixed compensation? Is it like a hybrid? So those are the types of things that you're gonna be wanting to consider and pursuing and, and working with an attorney on and having written within the contract. I, I know too many practices that are on, you know, handshake agreements with their associates and, and if something goes awry, it can get really difficult. So keep that in mind, especially if you're, a couple months out or in the future planning to add an associate. So if you've got some time, I'd say take the luxury to try to figure this out and do it the right way. So that's one of those tips we can give you. Lastly, like I said, when in doubt, <coughs> you're going to want to consult an employment or HR attorney for that guidance on how to properly classify your future associates or current associates and how to create the best contract in general. Make sure that they're, they're really there as the expertise to give you a yeah, here are the things that you're going to need within this contract to, to protect you as the entity or as the owner, owning doctor. All right, next, let's move on to kind of step number two, really, which is properly submitting claims to PPOs. This is one of our next most common uh, errors and mistakes, which is a commonly misunderstood way of how a claim form is supposed to be submitted. Um, there's definitely a difference between the treating provider and the billing provider. Um, it's a violation of most insurance contracts to bill treatment under the provider who did not perform the work. 
That's why on most claim forms, there's a delineation here in these two boxes. There's the billing dentist or dental entity, which is the corporation, whether it's an LLC or S corp or individual corporation. There's the name and address of that corporation on the left-hand side. And then there's a license and the social security number or the tax ID number. So you would put in the license number of the owning doctor and the tax ID number of that entity, phone number. And then on the right-hand side, you're gonna put in the information for the treating dentist. So whoever actually rendered the treatment should be going on that right-hand side. A lot of practices try to put the owner doctor in this section because for some reason or another, they want those claims um, to be paid a specific way or they feel like that's the, doc the only doctor that's credentialed. But according to, according to the contracts that you've signed with insurance companies, that's why the EOB form is written this way. The treating provider is the one who's rendered the services. So they want that delineation made for specific reasons. One, because each doctor individually needs to be credentialed if they're gonna be paid in network for the services. And two, heaven forbid something happens, a malpractice claim is filed. A lot of times when a malpractice claim is filed, they go back to the treating dentist. And where is that documented legally? On the claim form. So if Dr. Smith is the one who truly rendered services, but Dr. Bob is the one who was put on there simply because we were trying to make claims easier, but Dr. Smith is the one that drilled through the patient's mouth and then now gets the malpractice claim, again, it gets pretty sticky. So you wanna make sure that you're following those claims correctly um, and making sure if, if the whole reason you're putting the treating provider as the credentialed provider because of how you want your claims to be paid, then that just means that your treating providers need to be credentialed. And so that's what we're talking about today. They need to end up getting credentialed. They can be credentialed. It's not that complicated. Um, so we can get them credentialed. And so that way you can file these claim forms correctly and make sure that you're protected in the situation of like a malpractice lawsuit or something like that. Okay. Now, um, properly com submitting claims to the PPO also comes with understanding a group NPI number. So a group NPI number or NPI type two is something that we commonly get questions about. An NPI type two number really identifies the billing entity or the practice and all the treating providers that are associated with that practice. And that applies to some specific insurance companies. So if you don't have a group NPI number or an NPI type two number, it's likely because you haven't participated with an insurance company that requires one or you haven't put that on your credentialing application, but it generally is a secondary association with the insurance company to identify your specific entity. Now, it's also important to keep in mind that you might not have a group NPI number if you're a sole proprietorship. So if you have a single owner and you've categorized yourself as a sole proprietorship, you don't need an NPI type two, but any practice with multiple providers will be required to have this number in order to avoid payment delays with most insurance companies. So if you've experienced that before, that's usually the purpose behind it is it's a secondary classification if within their system of all the providers that are looped in with that tax ID, okay? Now, one more thing to kind of keep in mind when we're credentialing and adding associates is just understanding the credentialing timeframe and what's required. This is something that we take for granted a lot because we submit hundreds and hundreds of applications a month. But one of the things that we like to reiterate is just reminding everybody really what the industry standard has been, what the turnaround time typically is and what's required of you. Um, so that way you're aware of that prior to hiring an associate because you need to know it takes time. Um, it's unfortunately not a very simple process, but directly contracting or actually specifically credentialing with an insurance company. And in our experience, it usually takes an average of anywhere from one to three months once that application has been sent. Now that's assuming that the application was sent to the correct place, that they actually received it, that there was no problems. So if everything goes according to schedule, once that application's gone out of your email to their email or from your fax to their fax or into their mailing box, it's usually about one to three months for them to process it. Um, now network participation, so credentialing with umbrella network companies like Carrington or Connection or Zealous or third-party administrators, can sometimes take a little bit longer because they have to communicate with multiple parties. So that can sometimes take anywhere from four to six months. So that's something to keep in mind when you're about to start this credentialing process. It really just depends on the insurance company that you're working with. One of the benefits of us is because we do this so much and we do it all the time, we're in the middle of credentialing hundreds of doctors, is we keep a really good pulse on the turnaround time of submission to getting an effective date. So when we do it for a customer and we're sending applications out, we can usually give them a pretty accurate ETA on when that application is gonna be turned around because we're submitting hundreds and hundreds every month and receiving and getting credentialed hundreds and hundreds of doctors a month. So we're constantly tracking submission date, effective date, submission date, effective date, submission date, effective date. And we can see that trend change over time to give you a much more accurate um, 
kind of ETA. A lot of times our ETAs are probably gonna be a little bit more aggressive because we submit so frequently, we can really minimize a lot of the errors that the average practice is gonna make. But again, in our experience, it's usually one to maybe three months to get a network with the typical insurance and maybe four to six months for an umbrella network company, okay? Depending on which one you're talking about. So that's important to know timeline wise is it's gonna take that much time from the application going out to your doctor being effective or being credentialed. And let's kind of reiterate what we mean by that. The whole purpose of joining an insurance company or being credentialed with them is so that you as the dentist, as the treating provider, can get paid or reimbursed in network for the treatment you rendered, right? That's the whole goal of being in network with an insurance company. So that way the insurance company pays a portion or all of the rendered service, right? And so if you're hiring an associate and you're already in network, you, you're going to want that associate to be in network as well, unless you specifically have a strategy to have somebody be fee for service, which isn't very common. If you want the associate to, for all intents and purposes, be set up the same way as you, be paid the same way as you, is just a, a replica of you as the owning doctor, then you need to know these timelines and be aware of them prior to making these hires so that way you're aware. You don't want to hire somebody and then all of a sudden be like, oh, how do I treat patients, right? I got to go send this application in, right? Because they're going to be out of network for a, a large period of time if the application hasn't gone in, okay? So that's a timeline is one thing you want to consider is how long it takes to get the app out the door and how long it takes for them to process the app or get that application uh, credit or in network and that doctor credentialed. So again, if, if you can control, control the timeline and control the time frame by which you hire an associate, the ideal arrangement would be, I would want as an owner, an owning doctor, I would want to receive all the information that I would need for credentialing from this guy or a girl that I'm going to, that I'm going to credential, get that information from them, then send out those applications ideally and get an effective date that's prior to me actually having that doctor start at that location. That would be the ideal. It's not very common that that happens, but that would obviously be the ideal. Now, one, some of the requirements for actually credentialing an associate um, are basically the same for all doctors, but if you're hiring somebody fresh out of dental school, you're, this is something that's even more important because some of these things we need for them are gonna come over time. So a lot of dentists who are coming out of dental school might get their NPI number a couple months before they graduate, but their license isn't gonna come for two months later. And so there's things that you need to get them credentialed. So you need to be aware of them and understand that if I'm hiring somebody fresh out of dental school, these are some things that I'm, I'm gonna need ahead of time prior to sending an application in and be aware of, is there gonna be a delay here? So what are some of the requirements for getting an actual credentialing application out the door? So the first one is obviously an individual NPI number. Every dentist who becomes a dentist and is licensed for the first time receives their national provider identification number. Every doctor in the country has one. Every dentist, chiropractor, PT, MD, whatever, what have you, every doctor has some form of an NPI number. It's a national provider identification number. It's like a social security number for a doctor. Okay, so that's like their main identifier. So you're gonna need that, that's super important, right? So we wanna make sure they have that prior to getting these applications started. The next thing you're gonna need is a little acronym that we've coined that we call the WILD, which stands for four different documents. So the WILD is W, which stands for the W9. So you need to make sure that you've got a filled out W9 with their name, your address, your tax ID number on it, right? To send in with the application. And then also you're going to need I, which stands for insurance or malpractice insurance. So every dentist needs some form of malpractice insurance policy coverage and in order to be credentialed and network with basically any insurance company. So they need to have a malpractice policy that's in place that has an effective date um, that has specific coverage limits. And then the L stands for license, so dental license. They need their actual dental license. It needs to be effective, right? So some, do some doctors aren't going to get that for two or three months after they graduate. So keep that in mind. And then the D stands for the DEA. So most dentists uh, have a DEA license that allows you to you know, prescribe uh, prescriptions. And so most, of the, most insurance companies require that you either A, have a DEA license, or if you don't, for some reason, within the application, there's gonna be, need to be in a letter of intent explaining who at the practice is gonna write prescriptions if somebody else has one, okay? So for the most part, most most dentists will retrieve that DEA license or at least be required to explain who's going to write those prescriptions. So the wild is really that four pronged approach of the things that you're gonna need when you credential as long, along with obviously the NPI number as well, okay? The last thing that you're really gonna need, especially if you're a, 
a uh, dentist who's been practicing longer uh, than just recently graduating is a self-report and explanation of any type of malpractice incidents or uh, license um, if your license has been revoked or you've been penalized in any way in terms of a malpractice incident or uh, a suspension of any kind. Most insurance companies want a written explanation behind that. Um, so if there's anything that you would think that is tied back to um, malpractice or your dental license that you can think of, any type of specific uh, situation, that even if it was resolved individually with a patient or resolved and no actual actions were taken against you, they typically will be able to find that out when they're doing their credentialing process. So they're going to want a written explanation or else you're going to hold up the whole entire credentialing process. Okay. So um, that's something important to keep in mind as well. All right. Now, what would you do while the credentialing process is in progress? Um, what do you do with your associate? So let's say you've already hired your associate and you don't have them credentialed yet, but they're chomping at the bit and they want to treat patients. You want them to treat patients. You're paying them, right? You want them to treat patients. Well, ideally, like I said, you want to time the associate start date with the practice, uh, this, their start date with you with the corresponding credentialing process timeline. So you want to kind of plan ahead and say, okay, well, if I've got all their credentialing documents, I know they've got all their, their wild and their NPI number, and I just need to get app applications sent. Then if I you know, get those sent within the week, that's going to take probably at most three months. So if I was hiring, if I was sending that application out today, I know my doctor's probably going to get network with most insurances between like end of September, end of October. So if I can ideally control this, then I'd say my, my, my ideal start date would be like November 1st, if I can control this, right? Um, if I had all of his stuff or her stuff and I was, and I knew which applications I was going to send out. So um, that's really what the ideal process, if you can control it, that way there's no out of network time. You don't have to figure out any of this billing. Um, however, if the associate is currently at your practice and they're technically still out of network, um, again, they're going to be able to do a couple of things. They can still treat cash paying patients or potentially Medicare patients or HMO patients or TRICARE patients, depending on the plan levels. But for the most part, you're really gonna to wanna to stick them on those cash paying patients, or they can still also treat PPO patients, but you just need to be aware and the patient needs to be aware, ideally, um, that when they treat that, that PPO patient, that their claim is gonna get paid out of network. So that there could be ramifications there as to how much of the claim is gonna get paid, if it's gonna get paid or the patient's gonna to have to pay out of pocket, is the amount required gonna be more? So again, they can still treat PPO patients and you can still send the claim in, but again, it's more than likely gonna get paid out of network uh, because the te technically the doctor is not yet credentialed under that tax ID number at that location. Another common question I get is, hey, we're hiring an associate and he's been working for 20 years over down the street, right? Like, so he's already credentialed with a ton of insurance companies. Um, so, I mean, he should be able to come over here and I can just send off, maybe send off some info to the insurance company and you know get him credential here and it should be really quick the answer is kind of yes and no to that not necessarily whenever you're credentialing a doctor it doesn't matter if he or she's been in network with insurances before for 40 years at a different location you still have to go through the credentialing process basically every time when you're joining a new location you got to tell the ppo hey i want to be credentialed at this location under this tax ID number and I'm the doctor and here's my info. Now, what might make it a little bit faster is some insurance companies might have a different or smaller form for this scenario for a doctor that's already been credentialed elsewhere. Most of the time they don't, they require you fill out the full application. Where it might make it move a little bit quicker is you have to understand the internal process that an insurance company goes through when they're credentialing you. So the whole purpose of like sending in the application to begin with is you're gonna fill out all this paperwork to prove to the insurance company who you are as a dentist, that you have an NPI number, that you have a license, that you've never had a malpractice claim, right? That you're, you're not some criminal, right? They're gonna do all this, um, the check of all that information because when they receive it, they actually go through the, the credentialing and the contracting part, the verification. They're gonna go call the university and make sure that he or she actually graduated. They're gonna go verify the license number. They're gonna go do a background check to make sure that there's no malpractice suits against them. So they're gonna go do their due diligence. So you gotta know that that's gonna happen. However, for, depending on the insurance company, depending on their individual policies, that whole process of due diligence might not need to happen or it might be quicker because they already know that the doctor's legit, that he's got a license number, that you know they've already verified his uh, degree or her, her degree. So again, there's some things that might make them internally move quicker, but I wouldn't count on it. I usually tell most practices that even if 
doctor is coming over here from an existing location to a new location, assume that the timeline is going to be about the same as normal because a lot of times it is just because of how long it takes insurance companies to process applications. Okay, so that was another little tip for you. Last thing I want to talk about is really the honestly, it's the most overlooked and misunderstood and little understood uh, concept of credentialing, <coughs> which is understanding and identifying your current PPO participation and then how that's going to affect the credentialing of associates. So I just had a conversation with a practice today about this that didn't really understand or realize that this there were some ramifications here. So they were, they were approaching us because they wanted us to come and help them negotiate, which is one of the core things that we do. We help negotiate your reimbursements. Um, but they also had just recently hired an associate. So she'd been there for about three weeks, but she's sitting out a network because they still need to send in her credentialing applications. And so what they had asked us is, hey, when we sign on, can we just, you know, have you guys send these credentialing applications like the day we sign up, right? And I said, yes, however, majority of the time, we're not gonna do that because we need to know how do the two doctors at your location right now who are already there, how do they currently participate, meaning, how are they set up in the system with the PPO? What is the participation type? And what is the fee schedule? Because ideally you want this new associate, right? Dr. K, for example, you want her to be set up under the same reimbursement. The last thing that you want is for you to just fire off a bunch of applications and you've credentialed her under a fee schedule or under an arrangement that's different than what you're currently set up on. And when I say different, usually what different means is on a different fee schedule and it's usually a lower fee schedule. So that's why understanding your current participation and trying to map it out for the doctors that are at your current location and then mirror that when you're credentialing is important because if you want your new associate to be paid on the same reimbursements as you and not on lower rates or on different rates or to stay out of network longer, you need to first start, before starting this whole process, ideally you need to confirm the participation of all current doctors at your location to know what am I starting with and I'm, when we're not making assumptions here, what ideally you want to go confirm this and then go mirror it, right? So if I find out that if I've got one doctor and I'm about to hire another associate, right? So I've got time before I credential her. If I know that Dr. Smith is not directly contracted with Aetna, he's in network with Aetna through Guardian, I don't need to go send an application to Aetna for, for Dr. Katie, right? I just need a credential with Guardian. Does that make sense? Because what would happen is if I went and credentialed Dr. Katie with Aetna, is if she gets a network with Aetna and Dr. Smith has been a network with Aetna through Guardian, those are two entirely different fee schedules, meaning two different reimbursement rates. So what's the worst case scenario there, right? Dr. Katie comes in and treats a patient that was treated six months ago by Dr. Smith, the claims paid and it's an entirely different reimbursement. And in the worst case scenario, it's way lower. And so then your office manager looks at this and goes, what the heck is this? Like, where did this payment come from? Where is this reimbursement? And it's because we just fired off an application because we thought we were in network with Aetna, but which we are, but we're just not in network with Aetna directly. We're in network with Aetna through Guardian, meaning we're being paid under Guardian's fee schedule. Does that make sense? So I'm going to dig into these differences here of the different types of participation, because that's where I'm going to start. Let me, re I want to reiterate the different types of ways you can participate with an insurance company how you can then go ask each insurance company and confirm that information prior to credentialing. So that way you don't cause this problem to happen where all of a sudden I've hired an associate, I fired off a bunch of applications because I didn't know exactly how I was participating. And then all of a sudden I've now fallen in network with PPOs under different reimbursement rates. And when they're different, they're usually worse. They're not usually better, okay? So how do we fix that? How do we avoid that? Again, some of you are probably thinking, yeah, I don't think I've, I don't think we did that when we hired our associate. And this is the main reason why so many practices are on, on um, differing participation is because this is the problem that's created by bringing on associates without knowing this ahead of time. So we work with hundreds and hundreds of practices every month. Uh, we were, like I said, right now we represent over a thousand actively. And one of the most common things that we do before we negotiate is we have to go find out how every doctor participates with insurance. And literally 90% of the time, when we're working with a, with a provider or a location that has more than one doctor, we always find that there's a difference in participation with at least one PPO. We always find at least one insurance company where Dr. A is getting paid $50 for this procedure and Dr. B is actually getting reimbursed $30 for this procedure. And it's all because that we improperly or we 
we missed, we messed up or it was missed when the credentialing happened. So we're going back and fixing that for the majority of our customers. That's why I'm saying this is one of the most prevalent and misunderstood mistakes that practices make is not knowing participation before sending in applications. It just continues to contribute to the problem of my reimbursement rates are low, my reimbursement rates are different. I'm tired of PPOs. It's, it's, it's exacerbating this problem, which we solve by doing our negotiation and credentialing effort. But my goal here today is to just kind of educate you on how can you solve that problem yourself without falling into the trap that you know hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of practices that we've worked with do this every single day. So I'm trying to save you from that, okay? So if you want, uh, I'm gonna go over the specific steps of how to understand and call and, and document the current participation of every doctor at your location. So to give you the actual step-by-step -step process of what to do before sending in an application. But if you want that step-by-step -step framework uh, for collecting your current PPO participation, it's all located in this free guide. I've done webinars in the past about this, but the first couple steps of this guide, um, the purpose of this guide is to really teach you how to negotiate on your own. But the first part of that process is to gather your participation. So the step-by-step -step breakdown of how to do this in this guide, it's free, so you don't have to pay us anything for it. It's something that we give out for free. All you have to do is go to www.ppoguide.com. So you can go to that right now and go ahead and download it and start to look through it. Because in the first couple of sections, it's going to talk about how to gather that participation and document it. Because that's crucial to making sure that you credential appropriately when you're adding an associate. Okay, Does that makes sense to everybody. Now, um, I want to reiterate kind of the participation types here in this re-explain kind of how they work because that's going to be fundamental to if we understand how these work gathering it from the insurance company is a lot simpler and then being able to mirror it when you're credentialing your associates is a lot simpler because it will make more sense if we operate under the assumption and don't fully comprehend how these work uh, we continue as as an industry to create the problems uh, that continue to, to drown us as practices by getting our providers on the wrong fee schedules and on fee schedules that are low so if you don't want to repeat the error that a ton of your peers are making by bringing your associates on, credentialing them incorrectly, and then getting them on different reimbursements, then let's pay attention because these PPO participation types are super important to understand the difference. Okay, So there's really three ways that you can participate with an insurance company once an application has been sent in. So if I want to go credential with an insurance company, I fill out this full application and I send it in. Okay, You can ultimately end up in network with an insurance company under three different methods, okay? And a lot of these just depends on how you send in the application. Some of these depend on just if the PPO wants to set you up this way or not. So let's talk about this. Okay, somebody just asked for the link for the guide. Here's that link. Again, it's www.ppoguide.com. If you're on the webinar right now and you wanna avoid that problem, again, it's totally free. Go to that website address, ppoguide.com. You put in your name and your email. It's gonna email you the link to the PDF so you can go print it out. Um, I had it on my desk here somewhere, but um, it's you're going to print it out. It's a couple pages. It really walks you through. It's like a worksheet checklist of how to gather the participation uh, for each doctor. But again, I'm going to I'm going to just go into kind of some education mode right here. Perfect. Looks like uh, Adam went and put that link in there for you guys. So go ahead and do that right now and download that while I go ahead and start explaining kind of these participation types. Now, for some of you, you might be like, oh, I already know this. All right, I've heard Philip explain this like 40 times if you've been on other webinars. But again, this is one of the things that's most misunderstood. So I'm going to shout it from the rooftops until the day that I die or Unitas gets rid of me because this is super important to understand. Okay. So when you credential with an insurance company, you're going to end up under three different potential participation types. Okay. Most, most practices just think I'm either in network or I'm out of network, which you are. But when you look at in network, if you looked at it under a microscope, there's really three different ways. The first way is what's called a direct contract. So that's where I, as the doctor, have credentialed with insurance company A, let's call it Aetna. I agreed to Aetna's fee schedule. I was happy with it. So I sent in my application and now I'm in network. What does that mean? Well, when an Aetna patient shows up or they look me up online, I come up as an in-network doctor. And so when I go to this doctor and I get treated, I, the doctor, send the claim into Aetna. Aetna pays the claim underneath or according to the reimbursement rates I agree to. And the check is mailed to me from Aetna. That's a direct contract. What I just described is how we assume all insurance company work, all insurance companies work, but that's not how all transactions work or how all claims are paid. Okay. The second type of participation is typically something that happens to you. It's not typically something that you choose or create for yourself or join. Okay. PPO to PPO leasing arrangements 
are usually things that happen to you as a practice. Not very many practices know that this is happening, or if you do know that's happening, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just different. Okay. It's, it's different. And so if you're wanting to get paid the same reimbursements, if you're bringing on new associates and you don't want your associate to get paid on a worse reimbursement than you or worse on a better reimbursement than you, then you need to pay attention to this. Okay. So PPO to PPO leasing, this is something that you can find out by calling the insurance company. A PPO to PPO leasing arrangement happens like this. It starts with a direct contract. So let's say, again, let's use these same examples. We'll use the orange company and call them Aetna and we'll say the green company is Guardian. Okay, two really common popular insurance companies. If I've gone and I've directly contracted with Aetna, again, I've agreed to their fee schedule. I'm gonna treat their patients and they're gonna get paid in network. So what happens next, okay? Well, Aetna in the contract that you signed when you credentialed with them has the provision in there that allows them to lease you out to other insurance companies, right? Not just that now, almost every insurance company that you've currently credentialed with has the power to do this. What does that mean? So Guardian can come along. If Guardian does not currently have you in network, and for some reason wasn't able to get you to credential with them and they have you out of network, they want you in network. Every insurance company wants you in network because that means their claims are gonna get paid, the patient's gonna be happy and they can build their own proprietary network. They want you to be in network in order for this transaction to make sense, okay? They need you in order for this whole triangle to work, okay? Patient, PPO, and insurance company. So if I'm guardian and I need you in network, I wanna get you credentialed, but you, for some reason you never credentialed with me, you didn't send an application, I want you in network so I can go over to Aetna and I can lease you or borrow you from Aetna. So what that means is I can go create a partnership with Aetna, borrow you, I, I'm gonna have to pay a fee for that. So a lot of times companies will have to pay fees annually. There are gonna be large, huge fees to borrow groups of doctors or zip codes of doctors from companies like Aetna or other companies. So that way, once they've created that partnership for you or for par providers in your area, now all of a sudden, because of the contractual ability to do so, you might get a letter in the mail from either Guardian or Aetna that says, congratulations, you're now a network with Guardian underneath your Aetna contract, okay? So if you get that letter or if you don't get that letter, what that means is, congratulations, you now have the ability to see more patients that are in network underneath Aetna's reimbursements. So what does that mean? Well, Guardian patients may now start to show up at your practice because you're gonna appear on the directory because you're showing up as a network even though you never credentialed with them. And then when you send the claim off to Guardian, it's gonna come back and it's gonna get paid in network, but which reimbursement rates are gonna be used? Aetna's reimbursement rates, okay? The fee schedule that Aetna contracted with you is the one that Guardian's borrowing and that's what they're gonna pay you out on your claim, okay? Now, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily. Everybody wants more patients, right? So if that, by the nature of them creating that relationship, you now appear on a directory and start to achieve and, and, and attain more patients, that's great. Where it can potentially be a problem for you is if it's bringing in more patients that you were intentionally trying to be out of network with, or it changes your reimbursement because you were under a different method, right? That could be a problem. So you're now just funneling more patients through a bad fee schedule. That can be a problem. But most of the time, that's not the situation. But again, the whole purpose of me talking about this is in terms of credentialing. So when we call Aetna, Aetna is going to tell us, hey, I have Dr. X and Dr. Y in network through a direct contract. When I go and I call Guardian, Guardian is going to say, yeah, we have Dr. X and Dr. Y in network through, with us, but it's through our Aetna relationship or they're, they're being leased through Aetna. Okay. So that's the delineation that makes sense. That, that's the most pertinent here is, am I directly contracted with Guardian or am I in network with Guardian through Aetna? That's what I'm gonna write down when I'm making these calls because if I'm in network with Guardian through Aetna and I've just hired an associate, if I wanna make sure that I'm paid on the same reimbursement rates for my associate that I am for my owner, do I send an application into Guardian? No, I only need to send in an application to Aetna or else if I go and send in an application to Guardian, I've now directly contracted that provider with Guardian, and that's going to be associated with its own fee schedule, which will be different than Aetna's, and it may be lower, or it may be higher. So in either of those scenarios, one of the two doctors is getting paid a worse reimbursement, which is not ideal, right? So we, at a minimum, we want to mirror what we're currently being paid on, okay? We'll get into, in the, in the future, how obviously Unitas, how we can play with this system and get both contracts onto a better reimbursement or how you negotiate and get better reimbursements, but that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about what do we do when we credential an associate? And how do we avoid the common mistakes? Well, the most common mistake is I just far, fired off an application to Guardian because I was in network with them, right? Because I've been treating patients, 
but I didn't know that I was in network with Guardian through Aetna. So I shouldn't have sent that app and I really just needed the credential with Aetna. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Hopefully that makes sense. Doesn't look like I've lost anybody. So use the Q&A window though, um, if, if you've got questions uh, throughout the presentation. I know this is like a ton of information and I tend to talk kind of fast, but hopefully this is making sense. This, again, I can't, I can't reiterate enough how um, common this is and how misunderstood it is. So again, in an ideal world, you would understand and truly know what the participation is for each of your current doctors before you went ahead and credentialed, or else you're gonna create some problems, okay? Lastly, let's talk about the third way. Okay, so there, first there was direct contracts. There's PPO to PPO leasing arrangements where one PPO leases me out to another and that PPO borrows them. And then there's things called umbrella network companies. We call them umbrella network companies. That's not really their official name. They're also known as third-party administrators. Um, third-party administrators or umbrella networks are, are those companies out there that typically don't have patients. Really what they are is they're this aggregator and they've created a relationship with a ton of insurance companies underneath them. That's why we quote, call them like a quote unquote umbrella because they've got all these people underneath. So these companies are like Connection and Denimax and Zealous and Carrington and Maverist Okay, or Premier Dental Group or First Dental Health. A lot of these companies don't really have patients. So you're not gonna see a connection or a GIHA patient with a card that says GIHA or a Denimax card, right? Or a Zealous card. Really what it is is if you went ahead and credentialed and you are currently credentialed with any number of those companies, likely there are some PPOs that are being funneled through that company. So let me give you an example. Let's say at your current location, there's only one of you or there's two of you. You went ahead and you submitted an application into Connection. Connection also goes by the other name, GIHA, GIHA, G-E-H-A, whatever you want to call it, okay? And so you agreed to Connection's reimbursement rates and by nature of credentialing with them, Connection turned around, fired your information out to all the PPOs in their network. And now you've magically fallen in network with MetLife, Emeritus and Humana underneath Connection, okay? So if you're wanting to mirror and get the same reimbursements paid when you're hiring an associate, MetLife, Emeritus, and Humana, do we go send applications to them? No, we need to send an application into Connection, right? Because that's the mother, right? That's the mother reimbursement. That's what we're mirroring. Hopefully that makes sense, okay? So that's why this matters is because if we just send in applications, we're going to get different reimbursement rates, okay? So obviously, hopefully at this point, I've probably beat a dead horse here, but understanding how you participate for your current doctors is going to ultimately tell you how you need to credential your future associate doctors. The web that you've built for your current location is a web you need to replicate unless you plan on getting paid different reimbursements, which I don't know why you would want that, right? Uh, unless you're intentionally, like I said, trying to keep your associate or your owners out of network for intentional purposes, obviously that's a different story. But if your doctors, if you're planning on getting them credentialed, why would you want them to get paid different reimbursements? Because different usually means one's lower and one's higher for specific procedures, okay? Now, again, we'll get into in a minute talking about how do we get all reimbursement rates to go up or how do we play with this web or play with these arrangements and optimize them. But for the most part, this is the most applicable kind of conversation in terms of adding an associate, okay? All right, now I just wanna do a little recap before I get into some more information. So just to recap, what are the top three common mistakes on, and what you should avoid when you're credentialing an associate with PPOs? First one is you wanna consider the provider's designation. Are they a 1099? Excuse me, are they 1099 or are they a W-2 actual employee? Have you created a written contract? Do you have stipulations in there as to how you're gonna pay them? And again, have you had an actual appointment attorney review that to make sure that you've set this up correctly, both for your own benefit, right? So have you created a contract that's beneficial for you as a company? And are you making sure that you're not doing something illegal, right? You wanna make sure that they're keeping your interests at heart, but then also they understand the employment law, so they should be able to um, correctly give you and guide you in that direction. So that's the first thing you wanna consider. Next thing is how to properly submit those claims. So again, remembering that claim form and the difference between a billing entity and the treating provider and the difference and how if the, this provider provided the treatment, doesn't matter if he's credentialed or she's credentialed or not, they need to go in that claim form. Again, if they're out of network, then you need to get them credentialed and we've gone through the steps to do that, okay? Lastly is identifying your current PPO participation is, is crucial in doing that before doing your credentialing is one of the best ways to avoid the most common mistake, which is why are we in network with so many PPOs? Why are my reimbursement rates so low? How come my reimbursement rates have changed? The antithesis of this or the cause of most of these problems 
is improper credentialing and not knowing who needs that actual application and sending in more applications that then are actually needed. Okay, so there's your recap there. Again, as I've gone through this, I hope there's been um, some questions here. I'm gonna, I noticed a, a couple of things in the Q&A and some in the chat window, but let me kind of transition to the next topic that I wanted to talk about as well, which is really, if you're, if you're in the market for adding an associate or if you've added an associate, odds are you had a specific goal in mind. So what really was the goal or is the goal of adding a new associate or new owner to your practice? Obviously, it's usually one of two things, and they always come back to the same principle, which is either A, we're super busy and we want to capitalize on that increased demand, and we want to be able to do more production, right? So we've got, we've got more chairs, we've got patients calling, we're booked out four weeks, so why not get those patients in sooner by hiring an associate, even if they're part-time? Or maybe that's a specialist. Maybe I want to hire a specialist because I've got a, I'm referring out all this case work. Why, why not profit off that? Why refer out to an endo? I can profit off that as the business owner by employing the endodontist myself, okay? So that's usually one of the two reasons. I'm too busy or I've got all this opportunity or I'm the owner and I and you wanna do what my dad just did, which is I wanna work less. I've been working for 30 years. I wanna have an associate come in and work five days a week. I don't wanna work five days a week anymore. I'm 62 and I don't wanna keep doing this, right? So my dad's a physical therapist, he's not a dentist, but he's experiencing the same thing, right? He's 40 years into his practice. He's like, I don't wanna work five days a week. I wanna work four days a week. And so I'm gonna bring in an associate to kind of help pick up, pick up the slack. I'm the business owner, so I wanna be able to make that call, okay? So again, it's probably one of those two reasons. But ultimately, the, the ultimate goal in either of those scenarios is you're wanting to generate more profit for yourself, whether that's profit and money or profit on your time, right? If I'm the second option and I'm the owner, and I'm getting older and I'm in my 60s and I don't wanna work five days a week, I want more profit on my time. I don't wanna spend all my time working anymore. Or the reverse, it doesn't matter how old you are, maybe you just wanna capitalize on more of the demand and you wanna make more profit. You wanna generate and grow your practice. Maybe you wanna add a location eventually, or you're bringing on your fifth doctor, right? I just talked to somebody this week who, <laughs> they're, they're going crazy. They're in like the multi-digit uh, millions of production. They are hiring tons and tons of associates. They're acquiring location and they're growing like crazy, okay? So again, it just you're, you can be anywhere within that spectrum. You could be where my dad's at. You could be in this massive growth mode. But you got to think about what's the overall goal. If and if my goal really is to generate more profit, then let's kind of talk about some other ways, or even some better or more advantageous ways to generate profit. Which that's really what we were talking about in general is the reimbursement rate is something that we ignore, or at least we just complain about all the time as a practice because they're super low. So. It, my question really for you is if you're on the call today, you're ob obviously in network with insurance. And if you're in network with insurance and you're like 99% of doctors, you probably have pretty low reimbursement rates, or at least you feel like they're low and you're unhappy with them. So that's the point that I want to try to make is the easiest way for you to actually generate more profit and to make more money for the work you're doing. It, and that's easier than hiring an associate and figuring that out or bringing on a specialist or hiring on your fifth or sixth or seventh associate, or adding a second or a third or fourth location. If you're trying to make more profit, the easiest and the first place, arguably, you should place you should start is the profit that you make per patient currently on the work you're already doing. And the best way to increase the profit per patient on the work that you're already doing is to make more money per patient. And so, how do you actually make more money per patient? Right. Well, there's really two ways. You can get that patient to accept more treatment, which is pretty difficult. Right. You got to either you're gonna go get coaching and consultant consultants on treatment plan acceptance, or you're gonna just have to push more um, services on them, or you can raise your prices. You can make, you can literally charge more for your services. The problem with PPO insured patients though, is the majority of the, the charge or the price or what's being paid for the service isn't your UCR, right? You can set your UCRs at 50 bucks, but that's not what you're getting. You're getting your reimbursement, right? You may get a difference between the patient, but for the majority of the patients, that you're getting paid on. And for most practices, that's about 70 to 80% of your patients come from PPO insurance. So if really the only way you can make more money on a patient is through charging them more, you can raise your UCR all you want, but really what controls how much money you make on a patient is the reimbursement rate. It's the payment you get from the insurance company. I know you know that, I'm preaching to the choir. However, that's the kind of the bridge of the gap that I wanna make here is, if you're looking to hire an associate, you're obviously trying to capitalize and make more profit. One of the next things you can do in addition to that is to actually negotiate your, your reimbursement rates. PPO negotiations are possible, we do them all the time. They can increase your reimbursements, they can make you more profit per patient. 
So again, that guide I was telling you about earlier, that's free. It gives you the step-by-step -step instructions to negotiate your own PPO reimbursements. So if you wanna see the step-by-step -step framework that we do for our own customers that I've literally written out and given to you so you can implement it yourself, you gotta go download that guide. Like I said, it's free. You literally just have to put in your name and your email and you're, it's gonna email you. It's gonna automatically email you an email from me and it's gonna say, hey, thanks for downloading the guide. Here's the link, click it and download the PDF. So it's instantaneous. So again, I wanted to remind you of that, obviously, because this is what we do day in and day out is not only credential providers or credential hundreds and hundreds, but the core of what we do is negotiate for practices to try to get those reimbursement rates to go up. And we do it for hundreds and hundreds of practices every year. Now there's plenty of practices who actively do this and there's plenty of practices who want to do this or want to work with us, but decide not to, or just can't, like we either can't, can't work with them or they don't want to work with us. And so there's a process to go through. You can go implement that process yourself. You get the guide literally for free, okay? All you have to do is go to www.ppoguide.com, download that, and it's going to give you the step-by-step -step breakdown of how to gather your participation. So that way you can do that prior to credentialing. And then how to approach the negotiation process, the top PPO tactics and negotiation tactics we use, how to op how to maximize your reimbursement rates and make sure that those offers are competitive, all of that, and really how to analyze offers that come from an insurance company, how to make sure that you're paying attention to the right procedure codes, um, how to talk to an insurance company, who to call, all that's included in the specific PPO guide. Again, it's totally free. So. If you A, want to make sure that you credential your associate correctly, you need to go use those participation collection steps. Those are in the guide. And B, if you're like 99% of practices who accept insurance, you're not happy with reimbursement rates, and you want to go negotiate those, go download the guide to see the steps on that. If you want to talk to us about it, obviously, we can help you with two of these things. We can help you credential. We can also help you negotiate. Like I said, we represent thousands of locations over 10 years. We've been in all 50 states. We represent over a thousand individual practices right now. So we can negotiate and credential at a really high and effective level. So we'd be happy to talk to you about that. If you want to, you can schedule a free PPO consultation with us. All you have to do is go to unitishsd.com to schedule that. You also, if you've downloaded the guide, the thank you page literally says, hey, go check your email. And there's also a button right there to go schedule. So whatever you wanna do, if you wanna go download the guide and click the link, or if you wanna go straight to unitishsd.com, that will take you straight to the page you're gonna set your time zone, book a time, pick the time that works for you. And then you can hop on a, a free 30 minute phone call with one of us. It's probably gonna be with me. There's a, a bunch of other account managers here that you can talk to, but we're gonna just basically talk to you about your current practice, figure out which insurances you're with and what your needs are. Can we help you credential? Can we help you negotiate? What, um, like what service are you best fit for? We've got a variety of services for different situations, what the pricing would be, what your return on investment would be. We can go over all that for free on the call, super easy. So again, if you're looking to credential and to negotiate and you want to outsource it to somebody who does it literally for hundreds of practices every month, then you can definitely talk to us. It's for free. And if you don't work with us, that's fine. But at a minimum, you definitely need to go download the guide because it's going to give you the steps you need to, to solve the biggest problem that I've told you that's happening for thousands of practices right now, which is they don't know their participation and then they went ahead and credentialed. So if you want to solve that problem, go download the guide. If you want to negotiate on your own, go download the guide. If you want to talk to us, still go download the guide. So that's my um, that's my final explanation here. Um, but hopefully you've gone ahead and done that and downloaded that. And then again, if you wanna to talk to us, we'd be happy to talk to you and kind of analyze your specific practice. So you can either go to www.ppoguide.com and download that. Or if you wanna just immediately go book a call with us right now, there's plenty of availability next week. You just go to unitishsd.com and you can book a call uh, with us pretty quickly, okay? All right. Now we've got, oh, we've got seven minutes left um, in the hour, but I'm willing and happy to go as long as we need to. Adam, hopefully that's okay with you. Adam, is it okay if I, I'm just gonna go ahead and read through these. Is that okay with yeah, you? Go for it. All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna go ahead and just knock these out. Uh, what is the link for the guide? pboguide.com. Um, if you're, if you're Okay, so somebody asked, uh, Sandra asked, if you are out of network with an insurance and you have a new doctor, what do you need to do with your insurance claims for the new doctor? Do they need some type of verification? So if you're currently out of network and you're bringing on a new associate, you shouldn't have to do anything, right? You can go ahead and send the claim in under this new treating provider, right? 
What you're going to want to do, though, is you're going to want to make sure that that claim goes out with at least the first couple of claims go out with a W-9 that has a W-9 form. That's IRS. I mean, you can download that online that has your business name, your address, your tax ID number and that treating provider. And so what that's essentially going to do is most insurance companies will create what's called an out of network profile for that new associate. So they'll be, they'll just book him or her in their system, but they're not going to credential them. They're not going to put them in a network. So the claim's still going to get paid out on network, just like it was for you, like it is going to be for this associate you just hired, but you don't really need to do anything special there unless the insurance company specifically requests it. But a lot of times if they have some special uh, requirements, sending the claim in will trigger them to ask you for those. So some PPOs, very few of them have like a special form where you create an out-of-network profile. And if they need that from you, they'll send it to you after processing that claim generally. So not much that you really have to do if you're currently truly out of network. But again, my warning is a lot of practices think they're out of network or maybe uh, Sandra or Sandra, you said that you're out of network right now, or maybe the doctors at your location are, but again, we just, you want to reiterate and reconfirm that participation to begin with, especially if you currently have multiple doctors, because two of you may be out of network, but the other three might be magically somehow falling in network. If this problem that we're trying to avoid has already happened. Okay. Um, somebody else also asked if you're in network with an insurance, such as Delta, does the associate also need to be in network or can each doctor accept different insurances? That's a great question. So the real, the question is if I, the owner and or additional associates are already credentialed with an insurance company and I hire on an associate, do I have to credential them? Most of the time, the answer is no. It's usually the reverse. It's usually pretty difficult to do the reverse. Let's say you're out of network. You bring on an associate and you want to credential that associate, but you as the owner want to remain fee for service. You want to remain out of network. There are some insurance companies that won't allow that. Everybody's got to participate. But in most situations, it is definitely possible for the current existing providers to stay in network and to bring on an associate and continue to keep them out of network. That is possible. It's likely um, that you can set that up with most insurance companies. You just don't send in a credentialing application, okay? They're gonna keep trying. They're gonna want you to bring that doctor in network. But if you're intentionally trying to keep that new associate out of network and you're in, then you just don't, don't send in any application to get them credentialed, okay? Somebody said, uh, Michael says, it stinks if the associate doesn't stay long either or if it doesn't work out. So if we are out of network with a company, we could send the claim form under that person as a treating versus the owner. Um, yeah, so part of the, the catch 22 with hiring associates is you got to go through all this work to get this credentialing completed. And then in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days or three years or whatever, if it doesn't work out or they leave, it kind of feels like that was worthless. But again, that's part of the process. If you want to get them in network, this is the process that you have to go through. So if you can control the timeline, again, you're going to want to get these applications out the door uh, prior to them starting. And again, if, if they end up leaving, then they end up leaving. Yeah. Um, Nancy says, thank you for your time. Thanks, Nancy. Appreciate it. Um, Sheila says, we are in network with four PPO plans, such as some such as Delta do not negotiate. If we hired you, have you had success with getting fee increases with the Delta? Great question. So most insurance companies have a history of negotiating. The one insurance company that has historically never been willing to negotiate in our experience has primarily been Delta Dental. Um, obviously they have separate state entities. So there's Delta of California, Texas, New York, what have you. Um, and I never say never. I've prob we've probably seen it maybe like three times where they've negotiated with us or the client. But for the most part, we ask every time and we get denied almost every time. So it's very, very, very unlikely that Delta is gonna negotiate in the near future. Uh, we've been doing this for 10 years. And again, I think we've seen it maybe three times out of thousands of times we've requested it. Okay. However, besides Delta, most every other insurance company either has had a history or is currently negotiating in terms of direct negotiations and, or they also have an opportunity to be optimized, which I haven't really gone into detail as to how that works, but optimization in a nutshell is really going back to those leasing arrangements or those umbrella networks. So if your network with Aetna, for example, and then Guardian's borrowing you through Aetna, right? So you're in network with Guardian, but through this little borrowing relationship, this leasing arrangement, there's usually a way that you can get paid onto a higher fee schedule with Guardian by looking at, I'm gonna go negotiate with Aetna, we can negotiate with Guardian. Guardian also participates with Connection and Carrington and Zealous. So there's all these other arrangements. And that optimization and looking at all those different carriers and parties is possible with a lot of insurance companies. 
And so a lot of times that's what we do for our practices is do that optimization game. That's not typically something a recommended practice does on their own. I go into that on the guide and talk about negotiations is definitely something you can go through. But, and then I talk about kind of obviously what are the benefits of us negotiating for you, but then even more so the optimization is really like the reason why you hire a CPA to do your taxes as a corporate entity versus doing it through TurboTax is because typically, at least for a dental practice, there's so many benefits or there's tax exemptions or tax law loopholes that the CPA can find that they can really squeeze that, you know, get the most juice out of that in a way that covers the cost of their service and makes you that much more money. That's a lot of what optimization is like. It's really a lot like us operating kind of like a CPA, understanding the complicated optimization, PPO participation laws or strategies, and really kind of optimizing and maximizing those for you. Um, but whereas negotiations, it's pretty simple to go through that process. Obviously, the benefit of us negotiating for you is a couple of things. We have the leverage. We've worked with thousands of practices. We have over a thousand right now. So we've got a huge database of fee schedules. So we know what a competitive reimbursement looks like in your area. But then also we've got good relationships with insurance companies. So when we're negotiating, a lot of that comes into play. Knowing who to talk to, having a lot of leverage with tons of practices, knowing what's available. But then also credentialing is another huge aspect. We bring insurance companies a lot of doctors so we can actually bring something to the negotiation table. We're not just simply representing practices and saying, hey, we want more money, we want more money. We bring PPOs a lot of new doctors. And so again, there's some balance there to that negotiation. So that's really where we've had our success. Most insurance companies have a history of either negotiating or can be optimized. The main insurance company that's really never been able to do much negotiating or optimizing has been Delta, okay? Somebody asked, um, can you renegotiate if we are three years into a current contract? Yes. Um, most PPOs will typically renegotiate every two years. Um, somebody asked if for Unicare. Unicare, it really just depends is it, if it's falling underneath Anthem Unicare or just Unicare entirely. There can be some optimizations there. Unicare is an, um, one of those ones that doesn't historically negotiate very much in our experience, but there is some optimization that's opportuni opportunistic there. So again, most PPOs either have a history of negotiating or they can also be optimized or both. There's some opportunities with both of those. But again, that's something, uh, Michael, like you asked, that's something that you'd wanna jump on a call with us because we wanna know your state. We'd wanna know what you've done in the past, the other people that you're with to know really what opportunities there are. And then we'll kind of coach and walk you through what we think we can do for you and what the best strategy is and what service you're kind of the best fit for. Um, last question, Rosie asked, is there such thing as a good faith understanding if the credentialing process has begun and the associate doctor begins to see patients. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by good faith understanding in terms of like the contract with your associate or the PPO. Um, if the application is in, that doesn't matter. Um, the claim is not going to get paid in network. When you send in an application to the PPO, the thing that you're waiting for is for them to confirm that the doctor's in network and they're going to give you an effective date. So again, if you send in an application today with the average insurance company, you're probably going to get an effective date of like October 30th. Right. So what that means and what the effective date means is if the doctor treats any patient on October 30th or after the claim will get paid in network. So, again, there's not really a good faith where I send an application to you, Aetna, and I've now started to submit claims. And can you pay them in network? No, they likely won't. That's kind of the whole part of that transaction. They're going to wait till he's credentialed, effective, giving you that date and then the claim that goes in their system as much as it should go in yours to know. If it's been if it's happened after this date, the claim is going to get paid in network. Okay. So Rosie asks, what are the problems with sending a claim under the contracted doctor? And what you're asking is, what are the what's the problem with putting the contracted doctor as the treating doctor as opposed to putting the true treating doctor? So there's obviously two places. There's the billing entity on the claim form on the bottom left hand side, and then there's the treating provider, right? So if you're intentionally not putting the treating provider you're putting the doctor who you've already credentialed in there. The main risk is it's a, a it's against most insurance contracts and B it's against um, a lot of times it's a, it's against state specific laws, but mostly it's going to come down to that was not the provider that rendered treatment. So the insurance company can go back. If they find out that that was done wrong, they can come back and audit you and either re, you know retrieve those funds back from you that they paid in network, but they shouldn't have. So they can come back and do an audit, right? Or if there's a malpractice claim that's involved, again, like I talked about earlier, the treating provider is the provider that's typically going to get looped into that malpractice game claim. 
So if I put Dr. Smith, the owner, as the treating provider because I just wanted him to get paid, but it was actually Dr. Bob that did the treatment, well, if a malpractice comes in, Dr. Smith's going to get looped into that, even though he might, if you come and get, um, you guys actually go into a court case or there's actually a lawsuit, you can be like, well, it was actually Dr. Bob. Again, there's ramifications in there by not putting in the correct treatment provider. So again, just to keep the board clear and make sure that we're, you're, you're filing claim correctly, that's why the insurance company has those two entities. There's the billing entity, tax ID corporation, then there's who rendered treatment. And so that's why if, if this rendered treatment is done by the correct person, that's who's going to get that that's who they're going to check when they're trying to see who's in network is who rendered the treatment. So if Dr. Smith, right, is in network, the claim's going to get paid in network. But if he's not, the claim's going to get paid out in network. That's why you want to make sure you, you put it in the correct box. Okay. More questions. Uh, Adam, is it okay if we keep going? I've got one, two, three, four left. Is that all right yep. with you? Yep. Go ahead. Knock them out. All right. Uh, what do you do if the associate starts before the credentialing process is completed? I think we answered that. Um, um, Again, you can treat patients. There's just going to be paid out of network. Um, or if you don't want that to happen, you can make sure that that associate treats cash paying patients or Medicaid, Medicare patients or uh, other patients that might not be affected by not being in network. Okay. Um, so the goal is to ideally get them in network as fast as possible if they're already working for you. Or if you can control the timeline is to get them in network before they start treating patients. When should we credential a new associate who's graduating from specialty program? I'm assuming once he graduates, would be best time so we can negotiate a higher reimbursement for him versus the general dentist, or should we start the process while he is still finishing up his residency program? Credentialing a specialist or a general doctor, or what have you, is going to require that you have the NPI number and the WILD, the W-9, the insurance, the license, and the DEA. If you're credentialing a specialist, they're going to require his GP license or her GP license and their specialty certificate. So if they're not done with their residency program yet, then you're not going to have that certificate. So you can't be able to, you're not going to be able to credential them as a specialist and potentially get them onto a specialist fee schedule. So you're going to want to make sure you have that certificate when you're sent that application in. Okay. All right. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, Lindsay, all right, sorry, here's another one. If you have an NPI2 number, do you still have to individually credential each doctor? Yes. If you want them, their claim to be paid in network, then yes, you still need to credential each doctor. Lindsay asks, I recently talked to United Concordia and they said they go by the billing entity for in-network status. Is that correct? Um, again, it, yes, they go by the billing entity for in-network status in terms of who, how is the claim paid and what are they checking? When you credential, you're credentialing with a insurance company or United Concordia underneath the billing entity. So that's what they mean. Um, they don't just check the doctor. What they're saying is, I don't care if Dr. Smith works for you now or works for somebody else. Just because he's credentialed at another location doesn't mean he's credentialed. They follow the billing entity. So you need to credential him under that billing entity with United Concordia. That's what they mean. Okay, I know, again, it gets confusing. And a lot of times at provider relations, depending on who you're talking to, they don't really answer the question uh, clearly. But again, that's been our experience. You need to credential the doctor under that billing entity at United Concordia or at any PPO for that matter. All right, um, let's do one more question. Brenda asks, an associate works in another location for his own office and only works for us one to three days a month. If he credentialed in his office, do we need to re-credential him when he works for us? Yes, so A, I wanna make a delineation. The term re-credentialing is misused a lot. So re-credentialing is not what we want to use, right? So we're not re-credentialing him. You're going to credential him essentially for the first time at your current location, if you want, when he treats patients, if you want them to be treated in network or paid in network when he treats patients at your location, you have to send in a full application for this doctor with that your current location and your current tax ID number to credential him at that location. It does not matter if he's credentialed elsewhere, okay? Whether he's an owner or an associate, you have to credential him at your location if you want the claim to be paid in network, okay? And if you want the payment to be paid to your billing entity or your, your practice. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. And now the second thing is re-credential. Re-credentialing, the definition of re-credentialing is somebody who's already been credentialed. Typically every two to three years, the PPO wants you to send in an updated copy of the malpractice or the license to A, verify that he's still current with his license and B, he hasn't had any more malpractice claims. So re-credentialing is a recurring situation. So I just wanna clarify that on terminology. To, so you don't either confuse somebody at your practice or confuse the PPO because they can get confused pretty easily too. So yes, you need to credential him. You got to think of anytime a doctor is at any location, doesn't matter what else is happening. 
and I need to get him or her credentialed at that location under the applicable tax ID number with that insurance company. All right. Um, I think I have one last question. Rosie says, what are the problems of, or no, you already got that. So if, a, if it processes out of network, do I understand correctly that it's up to our office to honor the PPO fees with the patient? It depends on the contract you sign with the insurance company, but the majority of the time you're going to pay, um, you're going to collect typically, it depends on how the claim's paid. If the PPO says we're not covering any of this because of the out of network benefit of the specific patient, then you got to go collect the difference with the patient. In terms of how much or what you can collect, that's going to come down to the specific insurance contract. When in doubt, call the provider relations for that insurance company and have them coach you through what amount you can charge if it's out of network. All right. Again, thanks, Adam. Just like you said, if you have additional questions, please email me. Um, but that's all the time I have for you guys today. Hopefully this has been helpful to you. Um, and again, shoot me an email if you've got questions. Definitely go to unitedshsd.com. Go book that consultation. If you've got more questions regarding credentialing or negotiations, I guarantee you that the 30 minutes, they're a consultation. It's not a sales pitch. So we're going to explain to you what we think that the opportunity is and what you need. If you want to work with us, that's great. But again, it's probably the best 30 minutes you're going to be able to spend this year in terms of um, getting a better hold of what opportunities there are for you. And if you haven't yet, please go download that guide. It's www.ppoguide.com. All right, Adam, that's all I have. Good. Well, that's all I have. You made my job super easy. Tonight. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Uh, this webinar was recorded, so uh, it'll be in your uh, inbox within one week of tonight. Uh, but yeah, feel free to reach out to Philip directly or unitedhsd.com and his team will be happy to help. Thanks for attending, everyone. Thanks, everyone.